Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kent Branch February 2022 educational presentation. My name is Cindy Robichaud. I am part of the Kent Branch operating team and your host for this evening. We thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. Before we begin tonight's presentation, we wish to acknowledge that we reside on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation and Chatham Kent specifically on the territories of the Lenape Nation and the unceded territory of the Wapul Island Nation. From coast to coast, we acknowledge all Indigenous peoples of this land. We do have a couple of housekeeping items. Our presentations are recorded and available on our Kent Branch YouTube channel, which is open to everyone. Your microphones have been muted and your cameras have been turned off, but we welcome your questions. If you hover your mouse near the bottom of your screen, you will see the bar with the chat icon. If you click on it, the chat box will open Click on the little arrow beside the word everyone and choose the word questions instead. Here you can type your message or questions for us or for the speaker, which we will get to at the end of the presentation. Janet Van der Riviere will be monitoring the chat box for us tonight. And we thank you for joining us, Janet. Can we Good to be my... here and uh, welcome everyone. We're glad to see you. I'm just gonna turn my camera off. There we go. So let's get started. For anyone joining us for the first time, let me tell you a little bit about Ontario Ancestors. Ontario Ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society, is a nonprofit registered charity, which was founded in 1961. It is the largest genealogical society in Canada with a mission to encourage, bring together, and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. Be sure to visit the website to learn more about the resources and the supports available to assist you in your family history research. There are more than 30 branches all across Ontario and five special interest groups. And we are the Kent branch. We are located in Chatham, Kent. Our focus is Kent County research and general family history. We offer mentoring and education and assistance. We host monthly educational presentations such as this. Um, we have a monthly uh, DNA study group and we have a fantastic resource library. Our Kent Branch Family History Resource Library is located on the second floor of the Chatham Kent Public Library in Chatham. It holds 40 years worth of historical and genealogical resources for Chatham Kent. We are open once again Fridays and Saturdays from 1 p.m. till 5 p.m. So we hope if you're in the area, you will stop by. We always like to connect with people interested in genealogy and local history. You can connect with us at this email on the screen. You can also join our Kent Branch Facebook group, which has over 700 people who are interested in genealogy and Chatham Kent history. And we also have a very comprehensive website with lots of resources for both branch members, but also for the public. This is our homepage of our website. And on here, you will notice the master name index, which currently has almost 180,000 entries, which anyone can search. Simply click on this um, link and it will take you to the search and you can put your ancestor surname in and see if we have any information. On our website, this is where we put our upcoming information of our upcoming events. 
and we offer a featured resource section, which we'd switch out regularly. This section is also open to the public. So be sure to come and have a look. We also have one section that is totally dedicated to resources and one of a kind material to branch members that they can access from home. And this is the members library. Here you can see the different categories and each one of them is jam packed with different resources. We are constantly scanning and digitizing material and this new material is being added all the time. So be sure to come back and visit often if you're a branch member as this is one of the perks to being a member of Kent Branch. So now we'll tell you about a few upcoming events. Um, Roots Tech. Um, I don't know who has been to Roots Tech um, back when we could travel, but this is a fantastic conference. It is happening May 3rd to the 5th. It is the world's largest family history conference that is hosted by Family Search. There are literally hundreds of sessions and speakers that you can attend. And the best and best of all, this is free. Then on March 11th, we will be taking a trip to the Wallaceburg Museum. Well, virtually we'll be taking a trip, that is. Um, we will actually be doing a drop-in for a live chat with curator Kaylin Gregory to learn about their collection and what they have in their archives that would be of interest to family historians. This will be the first time that we do this and we're very excited and looking forward to it. You can register to also attend on our website or on our Facebook group. And we do hope that you will join us. Now let's get to tonight's presentation. Remembering their legacies, stories from Chatham Kent's black community by Samantha Meredith and Dorothy Wallace from the Chatham Kent Black Historical Society and Black Mecca Museum. Born and raised in Chatham, Samantha completed her post-secondary education at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. After graduating with an HBA in history and a Bachelor of Education, Samantha returned to her hometown of Chatham. Just a little over six years ago, Samantha began working at the Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society and Black Mecca Museum as their Executive Director Curator and has been giving tours, helping with research, and doing anything and everything that the job throws her way. Samantha's favorite thing about working at the museum and the archives, besides meeting all the amazing visitors from all around the world, is learning something new about their hometown, her hometown nearly every day. And then Do Dorothy Wallace, born to the Wright family, has lived in the historically black neighborhood of Chatham since her birth. Kim, can you turn camera, uh, um, Dorothy's cameras on and she can say hi to everybody while I'm, I'm reading your introduction? I'm trying to and it's not letting me. So okay. I don't know okay. if she can from her end, um, just on the Zoom bar at the bottom, if she wanted to click start video, um, she might have to move her mouse, but it's not letting me turn it on from my end. Okay. I'll, I'll just keep introducing her then. A little over seven years ago, she began volunteering with the Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society and Black Mecca Museum, and eventually became the president of the board of directors. Dorothy loves sharing stories of growing up in her community with the, all the museum guests, and she also walks them around her neighborhood. So Dorothy, were you able to get your camera on? Oh, there she is. <laughs> Dorothy has technical support from her granddaughter, which is wonderful. Thank you, granddaughter. She said thank you. <laughs> so this is it, Dorothy, everyone. You want to say hi, hi everybody? <laughs> so Dorothy will be staying with us through the entire presentation. And then we'll, you can ask her some questions at the end. Um, if you do have questions, please chat, type them in the chat box. 
Okay, I'm gonna proceed on with the presentation. The Chatham Camp Black Historical Society and Black Mecca Museum presents Remembering Their Legacies, stories from Chatham Kent's Black community. The other voice you will hear over the re- Oops, sorry. Research material is our executive director curator, Samantha Meredith. Let us start today by telling you a little bit about the Chatham Kent Black Historical Society and Black Mecca. Mecca Museum's history. The Chatham Kent Black Historical Society was incorporated in 1994, but but found its forever home in the Wish Center when it was opened in 1996. Later on, the museum's portion would gain the name the Black Mecca Museum. The museum open year round shares the story of Chatham's black community beginning in 1780 until the present day. We share the highs and lows that the community has faced throughout the decades. Many of Chatham's Kent best and brightest citizens have been from the black community. Not only are we home to the Black Mecca Museum, but we also act as a historical society, so we have a great collection of archives in our possessions as well. Our archives room. Housed here behind me are over 400 black family histories and genealogies. We also have a primary and secondary sources and a wealth of information from Chatham's Kent Black community. We will be showing you some of the resources we have available throughout our presentation today. If you visit our website, www.ckbhs.org, under the tab research on the homepage, you'll find a tab that says family history. If you click on that tab there, it'll bring you to a page that gives you a list of all the family histories that we have in our archives, along with the call number of each family. Once you click that link, the page you'll be brought to looks something like this, where all the last names or important people from Chatham's Black History are listed alphabetically with their call number beside them. Each family, like many archives, will have differing amounts of information found within their call numbers. Some families may have a couple binders, whereas other families may only have a couple family trees and a couple newspaper clippings. Each family is different, but each one is important to Chatham's history. Today, myself and Samantha are going to talk about only three of over 400 black families histories from our archives. We will share the genealogy information, history and stories about the Obi family, the Harding family and my family the rights. Without further ado, let's get into these histories. The first family that we're going to talk about today is the Olby family. In our archives, they would be call number 1297. When you open the Olby family binder section after the indexes, you're going to find the first family tree that we have in our collection, with the parents being Howard Randolph Obi and Arabella Hammond. Listed below them are their children, who are going to be the main focus of the history and stories we share on the Olby family today. Seven children were born to the union of Howard and Arabella, Harry, George, Clarence, or Clifford as we know them, Howard, Wilford, John, and Dorothy. As you can see, some of the spots on the family trees for dates are blank because at the time of creating these trees, 
the creators didn't have the information. When we receive more information, we will fill in the blanks, or that information may be found later in the binder in such things as newspaper clippings, oral histories, birth date, certificates, anything like that. Four of the six Obi boys would end up joining the Canadian Armed Forces during World War II. George Lyle would join as a singleman, Howard would join as a craftsman, Wilford served as a private, and John served as a sergeant. From our records, it looks like Wilford and Howard all served for the army in Canada, but George and John would serve overseas. John served in France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. In this photograph here, we just have three of the brothers. From left to right, we have John, Wilford, and George. John Olby was part of number four Canadian Armored Brigade and often drove the tank. In this photo you see here, John is standing on top of his tank. He has told us the story about how he named his tanks. His first tank's name was Lucifer and his second tank's name was Lucifer II. This past November, the History Channel had a special called Black Liberators of World War II, which John was able to be part of. The crew came down to Chatham area and safely interviewed Usher, as we call him, in our museum, as he's one of only a small number of black veterans left in Canada from World War II. If you missed the documentary when it aired on TV, you can watch it on the Global TV app or on Stack TV through your Amazon Prime video account. Now, how did John get the nickname Usher? Let's hear from Dorothy. Pam, the daughter of Usher, shared a story with us about her grandparents, Artabella and Howard, and their influence with the First Baptist Church. Arbella was in charge of the collection for the time to time of the church. She would collect the money in a hand, hanky and carry it home to, to Skein Street. She said she would count it and record it in the treasure's book. Arnabella would also bring the linen home from the church to be washed and ironed. Her her grandfather, Howard, was also a deacon on the church, and both remained members of the church until their death. Their involvement in the church trickled down to their children. John had always been a gentleman when the ladies would arrive on Sunday morning to go to church at the First Baptist Church on King Street East in Chatham. John would meet them at the door and escort them in to the church on his arm, meaning he was ushering in the ladies of the church every weekend and then ben, they began to calling him Usher. The name stuck well and carried on with him for over 70 years. And on this February 27th, Usher will be turning 100 years old. Here he is in our Chatham Colored All-Stars uniform from this past October when we honored him with a jersey because of his brother Cliff Olby who played on the Chatham Colored All-Stars. Let's learn a little bit about Cliff. Clifford, or as he was known to many people, Cliff was best known for being a member of the 1934 Provincial Championship winning team, the Chatham Colored All-Stars. Cliff played on the team for two seasons, in 34 and 35. The team began playing together in 1932 and would play together until 1939. But 1934 was their famed year when they beat out all the white teams across the province to win the championship. Now, I could talk about the 1934 Chatham Colored All-Star Baseball team all day, but given our time limit, I'm not going to do so. So, if you're interested in learning more about the team, check out this amazing online database called Breaking the Color Barrier at the following link. One of the big news stories in Chatham's history was when the Garner Hotel burnt down. But, have you ever heard the story of the Olby connection to the hotel? 
One of the most well-known stories about George Obie happened in 1929 when as a bellboy at the Gardner Hotel in Chatham, the news article said, I knew the way better than anyone else, and so I went up alone to see that everybody was out of their rooms. But the smoke got pretty thick after a while, and then I guess I passed out. Modest words th these, and it was a modest young man who used them last night after he had been rescued by a fireman from the flaming sheds of the Garner Hotel in Chatham in which he had collapsed while making sure that all the guests had left their rooms. While George Obie, 18 years old, colored bellboy of the hotel, does not admit it, he is here, here, hero of the fire, and Chatham people last night knew it. So after the beginning family trees, each generation will have their own tree of the husband and wives and then the children. And then if we have updated information, each child will then get their own family tree in the next generation. So here we have Howard Olby, who married Leona Wright. Let's hear a little bit about him. I am related to the Olby family through my oldest sister, Leona Wright, who married Howard. Howard loved to cook. His barbecue recipe was top of the line. He even sold his food on Emancipation Day from his home, and people often brought it with them when they went to Jackson Park to celebrate. I can only think about the food and the taste of it, but I was often unlucky if I ever got a piece because it was always gobbled up by everyone else. Now if you take a look here, this is John Usher Olby's family tree, and you can see here that he married Olive Steele. So Olive Olby herself has made history, and let's share a story about her as well. In 1963, Olive would make local history when she became the first black person to work for the AMP Corporation. She would start working at the grocery store as a cashier. Much of this generation of the Olbies have now passed along, but Usher and Olive are still with us and we are so grateful to have them as part of our community. Living on King Street East in Chatham for over 70 years, they are what we call the matriarchs of our neighborhood. So again, in our archives, the Olby family is called number 1297. Next up, we have the Harding family, who is the second of the three families we're going to learn about today. Their call number in our archive is 1180. Our Harding family trees date back much earlier than our Olby family trees did, to a time when the family actually had a different spelling. As many people who do family genealogy I'm sure have discovered, many families changed the spelling of their names over the years. At the end of the 18th century, the Harding family was spelt with an E-N instead of the common day spelling with the I-N-G. Again, like the last set of family trees, some information is missing, but these ones actually have a little more detail in them when it comes to dates. But this isn't the generation we're going to be talking about today. Instead, we're going to fast forward a couple more generations. The generation that we're going to be talking about today is this generation you see here. We're going to mostly be talking about the children of Andrew Harding and Sarah Ethel Spencer. Their children included Carl, Georgina, Florence, Beulah, Wilford, James, Leonard, Andrew Eugene, and Wanda Marie. Three of these sons, just like Cliff Olby, who we saw earlier, played for the Chatham Colored All-Stars, Wilford, Andrew, and Len. 
First up, Wilfred Harding, or as we call him, Boomer, joined the Chatham Colored All-Stars when he was still just a teenager, making him one of the youngest players on the team. But baseball wasn't all he excelled at. Boomer was known for his hockey skills as well. He even had a tryout with the International Amateur Hockey League and earned a spot on the Windsor Stratfords, a Detroit Red Wings farm team. This made him the first black player in that league. He even was the first black player to skate at the Red Wings Arena at the time, which was called the Olympia. One thing we always get asked when we're talked about the Harding family and Wolford Harding and his time with the Chatham Colored All-Stars is how he got his nickname, Boomer. Wolford's son, Blake, told the story how his aunt, Georgina, told him that she thought he looked like a comic character from the 1930s who was known as Boomer and that name has stuck ever since then. The next generation of family trees in our binder are these ones. These ones have some of the siblings who are the children of Andrew Harding and Sarah Spencer. You'll see here that we have Carl, Wilford, Andrew, and Wanda. Unfortunately, the brother James Leonard passed away at the young age of 29, so his family tree line stops on the previous family tree, but let's learn a little bit about him. James Leonard, or as most of us know him as Len Harding, played on the Chatham Colored All-Stars. He played in the outfield as well as first and second base. One of the teammates, King Turrell, said that he was one of the fastest players on the team. Len even held the record for the 75-yard dash at Toronto in the Ontario Public School meet of 1926. In his obituary in 1942, it was even noted that Len had a few tryouts with the Detroit Tigers around 1919, meaning he also excelled at baseball. And the third of the Harding brothers who played on the Chatham Colored All-Stars was Andrew, or as we call him, Andy. He was also a track and field champion in high school, and he was a really fast runner. He joined the All-Stars in 35 and played with them throughout the end of their time together in 39. He'd also later play with his brother Boomer on other baseball teams in the area, including the Taylor ACs. Here we have a picture of Wilford Boomer Harding in his army uniform. Him and his brother Andy would go on to join the fight in World War II like much of Chatham's black community. Wilford would enlist in 1943 into the number one district depot out of London, Ontario. He is recorded as spending time in England and on the European content continent before his discharge. After serving in the war, Andy actually joined the local Chatham Police Department, making him the first black police officer. Now Dorothy has a story to share about Andy on the police force. One of my memories of Andy Harding was from when I was about nine years old. A girl from school who had just moved into the community had called me a racial slur. Now being the little, little fighter I was, I followed her home with my friends around the corner from Victoria Park School and I fought her with my fists. She ran into the house crying and called the police. Now at that time only officer usually that they would send to the east end of Chatham was Andy because he was the only black officer on the force. He came and the girl came out of the house to show him what I did to her. Standing there as a child, I told them both, I would do it again. Andy gave me a lecture and told me I knew better and scurried on home to my mom where I knew I would be in more trouble than I was with the officer Hardy. Andrew was always calm and understanding with the youth of the community. He was one of the best officers we ever had. 
had on the force. Though this generation of the Harding family have all passed away now, their legacy and history making remains an important part of Chatham's history. Their children and grandchildren carry on those stories and are making their own spots in Chatham's history. Blake, just like his father Boomer, was involved in many sports. Here he is in his 70s from this past October's Field of Honor game, keeping up with everyone on the diamond. But even more remarkably, Blake followed in his father's footsteps and was part of the Essex and Kent Scottish Regiment. He was the first Black Sergeant Major with this regiment, the most senior non-commissioned rank in the Canadian Army. He served for well over 20 years with the armed forces. Now those are just a few stories from the Harding family history. To find out more, you can always access our archives and the call number for the Harding family again in our archives is 1180. And the last family we're going to talk about today in our presentation is the Wright family, who is actually Dorothy's family line. Their call number in our archives are 1461. The Wright family wasn't actually always known as the Wright family. According to our records, their last name was originally Harmon when they came from the Delaware area. When Robert Harmon came to Canada, he would change his last name to Wright. Though we aren't sure why they changed their last name, it is common for many black families to change their name upon arriving in Canada, as many would have come with their enslaved last names, sometimes the last name of their slave owners. Once gaining their freedom, more freedom was gained often by changing their last names. So if we take a look at the next generation of trees, we have Robert Wright here, whose first wife was Nancy Hanser, and then his second wife, Caroline Johnson. Um, so they actually have two family trees because they had so many children. So the first family tree we're looking at, we have Elizabeth, Walter, Nicholas, Frederick, Ephraim, and Cornelius, who we usually call Neil. And then as we can see here, the next set of kids is Annie, John, Robert, Edward, Charles, and Arthur. And if you look closely on the family tree, you'll see a little arrow between Annie and John, and that is when the mother of the children switches. So one of our favorite things in our archive collection from this generation of the Wright family is actually this photograph here, which is a photograph of all the sons of Robert Wright. Um, but if you look closely in the background in the very center, that is actually Robert Wright. But this photograph was taken at his funeral. So this is an example of uh, old timey Photoshop, if you will, um, where they put him into the background after the photograph was taken. So the generation that we're going to share some stories and information about today is actually this generation. So the father, Arthur Wright, is one of the sons of Robert Wright, um, who you saw in one of the previous family trees. Um, and him and his wife, Margaret Snooks, had a lot of children as well, just like his father. So this here is the first generation of those kids. Uh, so we have Leona, Leonard, Arthur, Alan, and Isla. And then on the second family tree, we have the children Belva, Francis, Dorothy, who's my co-presenter today, uh, Edward, and Artis. So Arthur Wright, the father, was actually a World War I veteran, and we have some of his records from being at war in our binder here that the family brought over. As you can see, I'm flipping through here, and these are available for researchers. Arthur Jr. would follow in his father's footsteps and sign up to fight for Canada in the Second World War. Here he is in his uniform. And if you ask me, like many of our other veterans, looks way too young to be off fighting for our country. The Wrights, the Olbies, and the Hardings are all just a few of the veteran families who fought for us during the World Wars, and we are so grateful for their service. You can learn about many more of these veterans in the archives that we have here at the museum. The next of the Wright siblings that we're going to learn a little bit about is Chatham's battling bellhop, Alan Wright. My uh, brother, Alan, was a boxer and coached many uh, baseball teams, including the Panthers. He bought, boxed locally at the Piranon Ballroom. He boxed in Sarnia and across southwestern Ontario. One thing I will never forgive my brother Alan for was when he told me he had uh, knocked out Joe Lewis and 
as a young lady, did not understand boxing. Joe Lewis at that time was one of the world's best heavyweight boxers. And to be told he knocked him out, I was a gullible child. I thought the story was true, and I believed him. I never knew the truth until I was 16 years old and learned that he had lied to me. I still think about that in this day, and since then I have never believed any stories that my brother told me. Going along with Dorothy's story, you never know what kind of stories you might also find in our archives here. So one of the funny ones that I've come across in the Wright family binder is about Cornelius Wright, who would be Dorothy's uncle Neil. Um, and he was fined for leaving some rubbish on the pavement. So in 1926, he piled some rubbish on the public street and he was charged $1 for doing so. So lots of binders in here will have newspaper clippings that have something a little humorous that w isn't normal present day because something like this, you know, they would just drop off a letter in your mailbox and give you a fine that way or tell you to clean it up. They wouldn't post it in the newspaper for everybody to see. Next up, and probably most well-known of these Wright siblings, is Eddie Wright. Here he is in a picture for winning a trophy uh, with one of his best friends from the neighborhood, Herb Wakabayashi. So Eddie, because he actually has so much history, articles, pictures here in the museum, has his own call number in our archive, like some of our other very well-known individuals from the Chatham Kent's Black community. Um, so Eddie's call number in the archive is 1462. Eddie excelled in all kinds of sports locally. If you look through our archives um, at a young age, you have him playing anything from baseball to football to hockey, winning awards and honors throughout the community. But most notably was when Eddie joined the Chatham Junior Maroons. When he joined the team, he is actually the first black person to play on the team. In the neighborhood, Eddie, because became fast friends with the boys from the Wakabayashi family in his youth. With them, Eddie, Don, Mal, and Herbie were always quick becoming involved in, in sports. One of his favorite sports was hockey. Hockey, like today, was a very expensive sport to play. So often the community and the community clubs would donate the equipment for the youth to be able to play. Eddie and the guys always had great coaches along the road who supported them and had their backs. But I never watched my brother play hockey. Eventually, as a first black player on the Chatham Maroons, Eddie was always making a name for himself. But I never went because of the racial overtones that was happening in the arena. Eddie wouldn't want to have to worry about me in the stands fighting while trying to play the game. So I made sure not to be a distraction for him and stayed home. Much of our family never got to see him play. When sometimes, which I definitely regret, but I am so proud of where hockey has brought him in his life. Eddie would continue on making hockey history as he got older. He'd eventually play for the Boston University with his fellow Chathamite Herb Wakabayashi, and he would go on to become the first black head coach of a hockey team when he began coaching the University of Buffalo team in the 1970s. 
And in 2010, that same school he spent over 40 years working with, the University of Buffalo, honored him with the dedication of their new athletic facility. They named it the Edward L. Wright Practice Facility. Though Eddie is enjoying retirement, he still continues to make history. This month, on February 17th, he'll be inducted into a, the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Like so many others, we could go on and on for hours about Eddie's career. There's so many more accolades and achievements that we have to share, but we can leave that up to you to come and check out the archives uh, and the museum to learn a little bit more about Edward Wright. My sister, Balva, and Francis both played on the Taylorettes baseball team. It seems to me that pretty much all my siblings were involved in sports throughout their lives. Whether playing or coaching, they always had some t t type of involvement. I myself never really got into sports, but I am proud of my siblings for what they have accomplished. And that is it for today on the Wright Family History. Who again, just one more time, call number in our archive is 1461 and then Eddie is 1462. And that concludes our presentation today on just three of the over 400 Black family histories from the Chatham-Kent area. The Olbies, the Hardings, and the Wrights are all history makers, just like you and your family members. Family history and stories are just as important, if not more so, than the dates being written down. We want to encourage everyone to continue to write down those stories, share them orally, and whatever you do, protect them from being lost and forgotten. That was really good. Um, Dorothy, do you want to turn your camera back on and we'll see if there's any questions from Janet? Or Kim, if you can turn her camera back on, there she is. I'm just going to say that instead of calling you Dorothy Wallace, I'm going to start calling you Dorothy Scrapper Wallace. <laughs> great yeah it does sound like a lot of the families um their children were very athletic yeah so yeah that's that's amazing and there were so many firsts yeah um, and I'm sure they're all documented in your archives you know uh the first police and the Scottish regiment and the first ho black hockey player and first coach there's an awful lot of firsts which I don't think people realize that happened in Chatham Kent and they lived right in this area. You know, that's the, uh, like our first black nurse, Blanche Pryor, was the first uh, a black nurse at St. Joe's Hospital that lived in this area. It just goes, and I lived here all my life and didn't know all these stories until I was about 60 years old, coming to realize what was in this community. And one of my things that I want to do is make sure that the next generations have this information to think that we build our schools and, and they were here and our churches. And these are things that our young people need to have to know so that they have their heroes so that they can go forward and, and feel good about themselves, I mean, to relate to. And that is so important to me. It's on my wish list. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so Dorothy, are you ready for some questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, first, I had a, a comment from Regina Stockus. She, yes. says, yes. she says, your dedication is admirable. And she also says, you're a mighty mouse. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell Regina is a neighbor and I thank her. <laughs> oh, she, I think she can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Maybe you said this, but I didn't catch it. Approximately how many family histories do you, do you have in your library? Over 400 binders. Oh of families 
Wow, and, that's fantastic. Yes. yes. You know, considering how badly the records and everything were kept, like that's that's amazing to have that preserved. Yes. Um, another question is, what are some of your, your earliest records? Oh my goodness. We have so, we have so much like, um, we have wills and marriage license and, and uh, it just caught me off. We have so much that I wouldn't aim an index. To so, oh. like our wills and, oh, we just have, I, I, I'm saying, dating back to when Sally Ains would be about 17, 80, something like that, dating back. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Because that's where we can date where the first in this area, because she was indigenous, she brought Frank, who she described on her census, was was her slave. So that's why we know that we had slaves in this area. Yeah. Okay. Through that. Yes. Yes, I, I found I found like when I photographed, uh, there's an abandoned cemetery out on 40 Highway uh, by the golf course. And when I uh, did some work researching the people that were buried there, many of them came from Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes, my grandmother. Thanks to you, uh, that's where she was from. Oh, so I I often wonder if that connection of black people in that area came there because of Walpole Island. Right, maybe. Um, yes, I did. I did. Uh, I think I gave you a copy of the book yeah. I wrote on the cemetery. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Alan Campbell. If I he says, if I wish to donate a family history, where do I send it to? Just straight to the Chatham. Uh, you have it there? If not, I have it. Just to the Chatham Black Historical Society at Black Mecca. 177 King Street East, Chatham, Ontario. N7M 4A9. Okay. Yes, Dorothy, Shelley. Dorothy, is your um, address also on your website? My address? Well, where you would like to be sent. Yeah, yes, it's all there. Okay, great. Um, Shelly Clark says, uh, yeah, she says, do the family just drop off the information and your staff will index it from there? Yes. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, Regina says, I went to the YMCA today and I found a roster posting where a black woman by the name of Shad was displayed. Is she related to the same Shad who started the black newspaper? All Shads, from our uh, knowledge, they are all related. There is only one Shad that we know of and if it's named Shad, then more than likely, yes, they would be related. Okay. From my understanding of it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, I have a question here I thought of. Which, uh, which family do you think left the greatest legacy in Chatham or the most memorable family? For me? I could say the Joneses, Gunsmith Jones. That the story is just, it just teaches me so much. And I try to teach people who come to the museum. His father was a slave that bought them out of slavery, him and his brothers. They went to Oberlin College. They came from Oberlin College to Chatham. He was a gunsmith's here. He raised his daughters who taught in the schools. 
one wanted to be a uh, doctor. Her name was Sophie. Sophie went to Toronto and got her nurse's degree, came back to Chatham and taught in the schools. She wasn't satisfied. She went across the border and she became Michigan's first black daughter, a doctor. Can you imagine from this city back in those days that this young lady and Ted, have, we have no idea. I just can't say her, the Jones family, Dr. Delaney. So I, I guess, so the, between the two of them, Dr. Delaney and the Jones family, can't, I can't, can't separate them. So like what, the, what, what era, what era would she have lived in? You're, you're talking about because he was part, it would be about uh, 1850 because he was, he was one of those leaders that was here when, when um, John Brown came to Chatham. He was here with his shop. He was one of the ones that was downtown where we had our shops and things. So that would have been ab about 1850 along in that era. That would have been very progressive, especially for a woman. Yes. That's amazing. That's fantastic. You have so many good stories there. Um, okay. Uh, Delaney too, because we're in this epidemic of 19, you know, COVID and him coming here and, and stopping the epidemic of, of uh, cholera right in the, stopped right in its tracks. I mean, I know we have a monument or, or a little, not a monument, a, a maybe a, a thing down at the downtown, but it's so important that the younger people understand what we did. We just weren't there for to be at everybody's service. We did things. And we're just not, we're just not uh, given the credit. And I, that's why it's so important that the educators, teachers, yet to know this story and how we were treated in the schools. I mean, we just can't bury this forever because it's there. And why should we always take what the US has? We're better than that. We are Canadians. This is a Canadian story. And we just put it under the rug, like we don't matter, we don't exist. There's, there's been a lot of uh, uh, black people that have done just groundbreaking things for not only this country, but for the world. And, um, you know, I, I, it's just um, really, I, I don't wanna use the word amazing, but that's what it, it's just, you know astonishing how how you're putting you know even at, at your age it's amazing you just you're just like the energizer bunny you keep going and going and 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 you know and um you know you work with us as well and um you know and I just did a story on artist lane she's yes. a, yes. a fa famous artist yes and uh, you, you know, and I had never heard of her before. And so, you know, what you're doing is just such an important service to the world. And well, again, you know, again, artist was raised here, right in the house, right across the street from the Freedom Park. And she went to CCI, as you well know, if you did the story. Yes. And, uh, my story with artists is that my father tried to get her to 
sketch, you know, to do her artistry, but I wouldn't stay still. So I never <laughs> ever. <laughs> so oh, no. Never... <laughs> that, would, yeah. that would have been a valuable piece now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because and the story of her was she had told the story of how, uh, you know, she she was modeling from clay right from a child yeah. Yeah. and from about age of six. And, uh, you know, when she got into school, the art, uh, the art teacher said, you know, um, I want to give you extra lessons. You can come home to my house. And they couldn't even walk home together. No. You know. She had to walk like a block behind the teacher or something, but That's true. yeah. It, you know, it's, it, go ahead. It's funny. It's funny. Um, growing up when I first was real little, I mean, I'm not that big now, but when I was younger, say going to Victor Lorston, I had no idea what color I was. It didn't matter. Of course, at that time, there might have been only five or six of us Black kids that went to Victor Lorston. But when we moved, and we moved to Wellington Street, that was like culture shock to me. That's when I learned who I was, what I was, why I was. It was a I was just Dorothy before. And then when I came over here, uh, like it was like coming over those just, it was just a street over, Dag Street to Wellington Street. It was yeah. like going to another world. So, uh, yes. And you knew your place. You knew where you could go and where you couldn't go. And it's still, I must say, we still got a long ways to go. Yes. Well, I went to school in Dresden, to the high school, and uh, interracial over there. And uh, everybody was your friend. Like, it, that was just, you know, that was not my experience. Everybody was treated, as far as I knew, I treated everybody the same. You know. My, my husband, Wyatt, tells the same story you do from Dresden. And do you realize from Dresden, you had two black men that were running your labs in 1960? You had Sherman Highgate who ran lab at, at St. Joseph Hospital and you had Wyatt Wallace at Pebble General Hospital, each of them serving for well over 30 years. And, and yet I did, I have seen some negative pictures, you know, from, from Dresden uh, in the yeah. newspaper. And, and it's said, stuff that. But he said in that school when he went, they, he, he didn't experience any of that. But well, I did going, I did uh, at McGregor, uh, sitting in the classroom at home economics. And she was Mrs. Gibson. And she would use that N word just as you drop a piece of paper on the floor, you'd get called that name and then you would just have to get up and walk and get out of the room and stand outside. Mr. Quigley would come by and say, why are you out here? And, and I just said, Mrs. Gibson just called me the N word. And I was told, well, you know, she's old. Should forgive her. That's, That's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was no excuse. No, no. I know, I know as, as children, like our, you know, children were not well treated well in schools when I went either. There was a lot of things that the teachers did that they shouldn't have done. And, and you know, but but what was done to you was just, you know, just totally unacceptable. Um, moving forward here, I guess you kind of went over this. I, I have this question, what is your vision for the future continue, continued success of the museum? To move forward in getting this in school books 
and to get the city of Chatham to recognize that we still have problems of the stigmatism and also in our and how we are received when we go into restaurants. Oh, wow. Oh, yes, you did tell me that story. So, Dorothy, um, is the museum back open to the public again? Yes, if you call. And um, I think we are only allowed 10 people at a time now. And I know on Monday that I'm having five. But okay, I don't see any more questions. I don't so see any more questions. Um, I, I don't see okay. any more questions. Okay, so thank you, Thank so, you. Dorothy, you're saying that people would just call and make an appointment to go for a visit? Yes. Sam okay. Spokia, and that we'll phone number, ready. and the phone number is on your website as well. Yes. It, yes, it is. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so, just before we wrap up, um, Sananta had um, provided uh, an upcoming event that you have participated in. So, I don't know. Do you want to briefly uh, mention it tonight? Uh, yes. It's again. We are going to present. Um, our stories to the Belleville Library, and that's on February the 18th at 6 p.m. And again, it will be uh, virtual. Okay, and is it open to everybody? Yes. It, Wonderful. Is it the, you said the 18th, it says the 16th on the oh, screen. Oh, 16th, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> no problem. That glass is here. <laughs> Just keeping you on your toes. Oh yeah, remind you gotta respect your elders. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay, well, we truly appreciate you joining us tonight. I know um, when we first talked about this, and you were still feeling a little nervous even tonight, um, but you did a fantastic job. Um, unfortunately, this is the way we have to be right now. Um, but hopefully everybody can get back and get go going soon. And for those people who maybe want to go for a visit or um, a couple of people mentioned they have some material. So either go to the um, Chatham Kent Black Historical website in the information on maybe how to contact them um, to arrange that. Um, but also if you want to drop it off to us, we will make sure we get it over to them as well. We have a, a great working relationship. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining Dorothy and preparing your information for us. Uh, we will tell Samantha, thank you next time we see her as well. And I think that's it for tonight. And I appreciate everybody joining us. And as I say, tell your, uh, technical helper there. Thank you as well. <laughs> I will. Thank you. Thank you so much and good night, everybody.